Welcome to Insight, today produced in partnership with KCOS 13 El Paso Public Television. Today we are chatting with Stephanie Carr, Executive Director of the Center Against Sexual and Family Violence. Stephanie has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Stephanie, for joining us today. I'm delighted to be here. So sexual violence is so much in the news today. Talk about how this organization started and where it is today. All right. Mark, we started in 1977, so this year of 2017 is our 40th anniversary. We started with a hope line that individuals could call 24-7 to talk to someone. Five El Paso women started this organization, and we're answering that crisis hotline in their own homes. Shortly after that, these five women felt like they were fielding phone calls that were necessitating a, a safe place to send people who were escaping violence in their homes. And so they put together a, a network of safe houses. Shortly after that, uh, they found that they needed more than this network of safe houses and opened up the Shelter for Battered Women, which was then the first time that we started a physical facility that was a shelter. So when the founding of this organization is this is the story of, of what women experience who have been the victims of sexual violence writ large, five women get together just talking about the issue of experiencing sexual violence, that in and of itself is a major hurdle that these women have over, overcame. Mm -hmm. And then they set up this, this hotline and then they find that the challenge is greater than can be provided through just a hotline. Mm -hmm. You have psychological counseling, you have safety issues, right. you have confidentiality issues. Talk about the first 20 years, your, your, your 40 year mark. How did the organization evolve through those various stages? Right. So really the initial focus was on family violence, domestic violence, and not so much sexual violence. Sexual violence was not really talked about 40 years ago or even perhaps 20 years ago. And even than, today. It's... And even, even today, uh, although more so. So the focus really was on family violence and providing a safe shelter for families, women and children, to stay while they were escaping a potentially violent situation at home. It was later then that men became welcome into our shelter and it's currently the case now. So we have women, men, and children in our shelter. Those first 20 years were focused on establishing not only a safe shelter for families to use, but also a support system around that, that included advocacy, uh, legal support, and uniquely in El Paso, immigration support too, because what we find in our community is that there are many undocumented women who are victims of family violence. And one of the tools that aggressors use to dominate and control them is to say, if you report to law enforcement or to anyone that I'm hurting you or you're being abused at home, then I will report you to immigration and you'll get deported. So those first 20 years were spent putting together this support system. After that time, it evolved then into a conglomerate merge with what was then the Women's Center of El Paso, a counseling center that was working very much along the same lines. And so those two organizations came together. And then that was the Center Against Family Violence. It wasn't until about three or four years ago then that the center merged with STARS, which had been El Paso's Rape Crisis Center. And that organization merged into ours so that then we have now this network of both family violence and sexual violence services, still to include our shelter, which is a core service, but these ancillary support services as well. So let's describe, as, as the organization has evolved to the present day, let's describe the various programs that you are administering. Okay. So we continue to run our 24-7 crisis hotline, and we take about 600 calls a month from individuals who identify themselves, who remain confidential, from youth, adults, anyone who 
want some information in general about family or sexual violence or specific information about our services or looking to come into our shelter, whatever the range is. That um, hotline is available in Spanish and English as well so that it meets the, the needs of our community. So we And it's important to realize, of course, that the volume of calls, 600 a month, it's not even um, in the week. Right? There are peaks and valleys, so you yes. have to have staff who are, are either bilingual capable or, or speak each of the languages. Yes. And then um, those people have to be available at the instant that the need arises. Right. So we don't put our crisis hotline on an answering machine right. or say, call back at 8 tomorrow morning when and just, just put your crisis on hold. Right. And that, that's, not, that's not responsive. So we're careful with, with our hotline. And so that's that was where we started, and we continue to do that today. Our emergency shelter for survivors of family violence and sexual violence uh, is in a safe place. It operates 24-7. It's available to anyone, regardless of gender, regardless of citizenship, regardless of where they may live, so that the criteria to come into our shelter is, are you in immediate danger? And, and do you need a safe place to stay? And it's important that the location remain confidential. Yes. It's important that it be secure. It's important that uh, particularly uh, women, but also men who are suffering violence, that they not be, they not live also in fear of having ICE show up um, at, at the doorstep. Correct. And so we keep our, our location confidential and we have security measures so that those coming in uh, are authorized to do so. On any given day, we always have way more children in our shelter than adults. Most women who come have two, three, or four children that they bring with them. On occasions, we have fathers who come with their children as well. We also recognize that there is family and sexual violence within the LGBT community. So we have individuals who have experienced that kind of violence in their relationships at our shelter as well. We do not have a minimum length of stay in the shelter, although the average length of stay is about 30 to 35 days. So it's, it's immediate crisis, have a safe place that's safe, breathe and regroup. And then we have advocates who work with those individuals who come into our shelter to identify what is it next for you? What, what do you need? Do you need a protective order? Do you need to find another place to live? Do you need legal support? What is it that you need in order to move forward? Talk about the children who come in holding their mom or dad's hands mm -hmm. or the, the youth sometimes who also uh, come in, who are just at that point where they're navigating that transition into, into adulthood. Um, how is their experience uh, shaped uh, by your staff in this very traumatic time in their lives? Mm -hmm. well, what we know about children, and there's plenty of research to substantiate that, is that exposure to violence um, that children uh, experience has the same long-term effect as if they were victims of the actual violence themselves. So witnessing it. And sometimes individuals may think you know, that the baby's asleep in the next room doesn't understand what's going on. And that's not the case. And so we uh, have a great children's team that are highly skilled in identifying the trauma that children have experienced as a result of their exposure to violence or, or being subjected to it outright, both from a therapeutic uh, intervention standpoint with our child therapist, but also within the context of the simple activities that we do in our little school in the shelter, which is for our preschool kids. So what are the, what are the play activities that you put in place that help children express what they have experienced and, and, process and start, that. exactly, start that, that healing? Now, men, young men, boys, males in this society, bear a special relationship to sexual violence. Mm -hmm. Most sexual violence is perpetrated by men against women. How do you help men to adjust our attitudes to our relationship with women? And how do we adjust society's idea of how we express a power and what kind of 
of power is, is appropriate to, to express. One of the important programs that uh, we've been piloting for the last three years is a primary prevention program at one of our local high schools, which really focuses on those exact issues of gender equality and the stereotypes of what uh, a male supposed to do and act and behave and, and a female. And what, what respect that looks means. Like. Right, exactly. And it, and you mentioned power. Is there is there a place for power in relationship? And, and so we, we try and talk about power and what does that mean in terms of, of who's in charge and who gets to decide what's going to happen next. And how can you break down the, those power barriers so that that there's equality and opportunities for a, a healthy exchange of expressing needs or wants or what what you want out of that relationship. We just heard today of another resignation from a major media figure. There have been um, a whole range of issues and more to come, I'm sure, from our politicians, our business professionals, uh, entertainment professionals. Sports figures. Sports figures. How do we we create a dialogue in which people aren't defensive, but instead are receptive to the transformation that they have to undergo, that, that women have more of a voice, that that voice is respected and listened to, that uh, men are responding in ways that, that adjust their own attitudes. How do we shift this society in, in the United States? Well, I think that what, what we have now seen in the last couple of months related to uh, patterns of sexual assault or sexual entitlement or, or privilege um, in in realms it, it, across society. Again, go back to that core idea of who has power and privilege to do as as they wish. And I think the the responses that have been the strongest and will have the longest term effect are those that where businesses or Organizations have said, not acceptable, and you are no longer employed with us. And while you don't want dollars and cents to run the world, uh, that's a, economics is a real push in terms of here's what, what's not acceptable anymore within our organization. And so I'm really hopeful then that this shift of it's not okay in Congress to pay a settlement with taxpayer dollars that no one knows about and have someone be required to sign a non-disclosure agreement um, and no consequences for the aggressor as a result of that. But when you lose your job, when you're kicked off of a sports team, when you're removed from uh, a seat in the committee in the Senate, that's going to shift our paradigm in terms of how we think about what's okay. Stephanie Carr, thank you so much for You're sharing welcome. the work of the Center Against Sexual and Family Violence in El Paso, and thank you so much for your insights. You're welcome. Thank you.